All right, welcome to the stream, everyone. Here with me is Dan Frio. My name is Kyle. Um, so hey, we're going to answer your home buying questions uh, today. So feel free to leave those in the chat. We already got a few people in here. We have Janet, uh, Lily Rose, uh, Donald Beck, Daniel Ramirez. Um, we're going to get to your questions here in just a second. But uh, Dan, how was your how was your Christmas? It was fantastic. I had the kids come over. We had dinner. We ate all day long and it was just awesome. And then I worked yesterday, had payroll to do and some other stuff. And if you guys asked any questions yesterday via Kyle, he'll show you how to answer questions or ask out, ask us for questions. I did a bunch of those yesterday as well. Nice. So it was good. How about you? Uh, mine was pretty nice. You know, I, it feels strange. I feel like it gets, it's warmer and warmer every single year for Christmas. And so it's like, <laughs> it does not. If it wasn't like... rain. We were we were we were going to cook out. That's how warm it was in Chicago. And but it rained, so I put the pulled the uh, grill into the garage, and the garage was still fifty something degrees out. So it was like it was awesome. This is the no, only thing but... giving me a little bit of a winter yeah. spirit here is the, the fake snow on top. It'll come. It'll come. <laughs> you guys get your your weather. You get weather like a day or two after we get it. So it it's the yeah, last night was frigid. Uh, Alex said, I just want to say, I watched Dan's video every day, recently got into title insurance and the channel is super helpful. Um, well, Wade thanks. said, appreciate the daily updates. Uh, thanks Dan. So that's sweet. Um, cool. Do you want to walk through, um, just what's been going on in the market? What's going on yeah. with the interest rates? Uh, what news we have here? Yeah, it's, it was fantastic news throughout all the way up to Christmas. Uh, we had the Federal Reserve come in last uh, lab about two weeks ago and they didn't raise rates. And then a lot of people were saying, well, they didn't raise rates. And, you know, and so why did mortgage rates go down? That's a whole different avenue. So if you if you want to check those on a daily basis, check out my my YouTube videos on a daily basis. But the Federal Reserve basically came in and they said inflation's coming in check. Uh, some of the, the I think some of the Federal Reserve people got in a little bit of trouble because some of them came in and said, you know, the inflation's fantastic and everything else. And I've been saying this. If you watch my channel, I've been saying the Federal Reserve is doing this. They, they know inflation is coming down. It's coming down rapidly. But what they can't do is come out and say, OK, guys, you know, we basically are at our, at our target rate. So we're, we're good with this because the reason because you'd see the stock market just rally and mortgage rates plummet. That's exactly what happened in the Federal Reserve's freaking because I don't know about you, but you know, when the stock market goes up and you're, you have job security and things like that, you're pretty happy and you're content with things. So then you have a tendency to maybe spend a little bit more on yourself, go out to dinner and things like that. That's what the Federal Reserve doesn't want. They don't want us to keep spending and spending and spending. That's what was driving up the prices of everything as well as the supply chain. Uh, so a lot of that is easing. And now we're starting to get a little bit normalcy in the markets, as you can see on a daily basis. If, again, if you follow my channel, mortgage rates have basically been flat over the last week, and that's been very uncommon. So we love when there's really no economic news out. There's one piece of information coming out tomorrow. It's the the initial jobless report. So that's really not going to sway the market. And it's just a, it's just a slow week uh, at Wall Street and the bond markets and so forth. So I predicted rates are just going to be stagnant until everybody gets back into the market next week, and then. We're going to have a whole new round of, you know, what's going on and so forth. And 2024 is a, an election year. So that's going to throw a little bit of curveballs at things, but I'll keep you informed on a daily basis. Nice. So the big question is like, are interest rates going to keep going lower? Yeah. I mean, I'm predicting here's and, and it was funny because on CNBC, I use a system called MBS Live. And if you, like I said, if you watch my channel every day, that we reference their, the bond markets and all that stuff within that system. Well, that guy who, who is the editor there, he's, he's now on CNBC. He does housing reports there. Uh, I think it's like every couple weeks. And he kind of verbatim was going over what I was saying. You know how there's usually the, the, the 10-year treasury bond. You can follow that and figure out what's going on with mortgage rates. But over the last year, you can't. There's a huge disconnect. And the, the, the channel isn't long enough to go over this today. And you guys don't want to hear it. But based on all the economics and history, rates should be at, in the mid fives uh, by this time next year, if not lower. Some are even saying they could go back into the fours. I'm not in that camp. I'm saying I'd be happy if they went back to five and a half. And I think that's a, a, a little bit more normalcy to this market. And I don't ever see us going back to two or three percent, but you'd never know. But, you know, if you're looking at, at some things, you know, I would 
I would kind of predict, and I'm coming out with my videos next week, is you know a five and a half percent rate uh, for for 2024, and that's what I predicted this year. And I'm a little bit off, and I'm getting grief for it, but I'm not that far off. So many people was basically saying the world's going to end, the markets are going to crash, rates are going to do this and all that. I I'm going to come out and grade myself next week, but I think I did pretty darn good. Uh, when it comes to predicting the housing market, I kind of hit that right on the button and my mortgage rates, I'm a sliver off, but not that far off. So it was a good call. And what do you think is going to happen with like home prices as rates continue to go lower? Is that going to support home prices? Are we going to see the opposite yep. effect? Is the whole market going to crash? <laughs> so here's what I'm saying. It's going to, it's going to create more of a flat, a flatness in the market. And, and here's what I mean by that. What, what has caused prices? I just posted a video yesterday and the Case Shiller Index came out and, and home prices had the biggest one month jump in all of 2023. And it basically came at a time when interest rates hit 8%. People are like, what's going on? So basically there is no houses for sale. Okay, so if you want to buy a house, you're going to have to pay up in this market. You're going to have to pay a higher rate and you're going to have to most likely pay a higher price for that home because there, there's still you know, multiple bids on homes. So what, what's going to happen is when rates come back down to five and a half percent ish, people are all, all saying, you know, it's going to flood the market. And there's going to be FOMO again and everything else. We're still not going to have a ton of people jumping back into the markets like myself. I'm not going to put out my house for sale. Um, you know, I, I got a great rate and I'm not looking to, to sell, but it should create more stability or, or more flatness in the market, meaning there's going to be more houses on the market. So it'll give the buyers more to choose from. That's that's good news. Thus, it won't you know keep prices going up. But there's not going to be a flood of houses to the market that would cause prices to come down. So there'll be more more for sale. Um, but it it'll it's still not going to fit the void of where the the big gap that we have right now in in you know there's just no houses for sale. That's the perfect example. Yeah. So yeah, it, it, again, if rates go to five and a half percent, that might push some people to say, yeah, I'm going to sell my house, but it's not going to be enough to get a huge glut into the market. You know, yeah. so that's that's going to keep house inventory down as well as foreclosures. Now, you're going to start seeing a lot of people saying, oh, we're if we hit a recession, that means a lot of people are going to lose their jobs and everybody's going to go into foreclosure. Guys, guys relax. It, it's not most people have equity in their house. So you go into foreclosure when you owe more on your house than it's worth. You know, we saw most houses in the U.S. just this year alone up about 5%. Some some areas a little bit more, some a little bit less, but the average home was up 5%. Then let's say you put down 3 4 5% on, as a down payment. So you have that cushion there on equity, and you can use that, you know, before you would go into foreclosure. So you're not going to see foreclosures running rampant. You know, some people that's going to you know, be what they hang their hat on, but you're not going to see that. You're not going to see a huge amount of inventory come. And there's not even if you will follow the building permits and new construction, they're not filling this void either. There's still a there's still a disconnect there. So we still have a housing shortage. Interest rates are only going to fuel that a little bit more, but it will bring in some more existing homes to the market. I wanted to show this uh, chart because I saw some people mentioning um like, okay, well, with interest rates drop, you know, coming down to like the six and a half percent range, that all of a sudden people are going to want to start selling their home. Um, and this chart, this chart shows how many uh, people have different, you know, different interest rates on their current home. So people who have below 3%, if we look over here, there's about 25% of homeowners who have less than a 3% mortgage. And then when we go all the way to 60% of people have less than a 4%. Um, 80 percent of people have less than a five percent interest rate and 90 percent of people have less than a six percent interest rate so it's like we're nowhere near that level where seeing those lower rates is going to be more enticing for people who want to go and sell their home like you're mentioning dan is you're not going to give up your what do you have two seven five or something like that i have 2.625 on my house okay. <laughs> all right shut up <laughs> so the like it's it's not we're nowhere near that point where it's really advantageous for people to want to sell their home um, because they have such a low interest rate and the market rate just isn't close uh, to that. You know, we're sitting around the average six and a half percent. And it's like, well, those people are going to be, um, you know, in this red category, which we only have 10 percent of people here who may benefit from something like a refinance or selling may give a tiny um, benefit if they get a new interest rate on a new loan. So yep, uh, let's let's jump into some questions here. Uh, Marsha, 
good to see you again. Uh, you said hello. Um, let's see, Janet. Uh, you said hello. I have a question. Can you talk about USDA direct loans? First time home buyer loan process. What's your recommendation? Um, okay, so that's a lot there. USDA direct is only available directly through USDA. Um, and I kind of use that as a, a way to say like USDA direct because it's th directly through USDA. No other lender can offer USDA direct. I told that to somebody once and they were like, you're so rude. <laughs> I, <was> like, <laughs> I don't understand how that's rude. Uh, USDA direct, it's called direct because it's directly through USDA. Um, that's how I remember it. And uh, so I, I don't know. I'm not super familiar with USDA direct and all the ins and outs of it. Um, they are for people who have lower income um, and USDA does have a guideline on that. So if you have uh, low to moderate income, USDA guaranteed, which is through a lot of lenders. If you have low income, it's USDA direct. Um, they also do have a subsidy program, which can help you with monthly payments, but uh, it's not something a loan officer, most loan officers you'll run into can help you with. You have to go directly to USDA um, to get a USDA direct uh, loan. Um, is right now a good time to buy since rates are lower now? You want to take that, Dan? It's, it's, I mean, it, I, here's the, here's what I always tell people. And this is kind of a weird answer. When is the perfect time? If, if you're talking to like a married couple, when's the perfect time to have a kid? You know, that might be a little bit off cuff, but is there really a perfect time to do anything? So, you know, mortgage rates, they're lower. Well, they're still not low, you know, they're, they're not to 2% or 3% we were, um, but, you know, you'd, you're the only one that can answer that question. You know, do you have enough money set aside uh, for a rainy day? Do you have enough money set aside for a down payment? Um, do, is your income, is it steady? Is your job really secure? You know, how's your credit? You know, things like that. Are you financially ready for that? It's like, you know, saying, am I ready for retirement? I'm not ready for retirement yet. That number will come eventually. Uh, but when, when you're looking to buy a house, it's, it's not me or Kyle or a YouTube or anybody that can say, you know, it's the perfect time for you to buy. That's only up to you guys. What we try to do here on the channel is explain these things to you because there's a lot of information out there that's just bad. It's just bad. So we try to educate you guys on saying, don't listen to us about if it's a good time to buy or not. Please make that decision on your own. We're here to give you the tools to see, does it make sense? Or, you know, what program might fit for you? What different uh, options do you have? You know, if you don't have enough of the down payment, things like that to navigate you through this, but not to determine, you know, yes, you should buy. That's completely on your end. And I'm not trying to cop out of that, but it is a, a, a you issue. Um, not issue, but you understand what I'm saying. It's it's something that you have to determine on your own if it's good for you and your family. Right. But we're we're just here to help facilitate it. it you know, once you elect that, yes, that is it's what I want to do. Um, if we purchased a house two years ago, how long do we have to wait to buy as a first time buyer, um, or is our only option conventional with twenty percent down? Um, so I can take that. So first time buyer is someone who hasn't uh, been on title to a home in the past three years, but you don't need to be a first time buyer to buy another home um, if you're not wanting to stay in your current one. So with a conventional loan, it would be 5% down um, unless you are under a certain income limit, which would be 80% of the area median income. You don't have to figure that out. We help you do that. Find out where you're buying and can find that area. Um, so if that's the case for you, if you're under that income limit, which in most areas tends to be around $80,000 per year, then you can do 3% down on conventional. If you're above that limit, then you'd be 5% down as a minimum on a conventional loan. The other option is if you're looking at an FHA loan, you don't have to be a first time buyer um, and there is no income limit. It's three and a half percent down. So you do not have to do 20% down. You'll be perfectly fine. And for most people buying their second home really isn't much different from buying their, uh, their first home. Uh, Ronald, um, if I have a 800 credit score, $50,000 in cash, but only make about 15,000 a year because I'm in college. How could I qualify for a home in California? I have access to co-signers with good credit. Who that's a doozy. So basically I hate to say it this way, but your co-signer will be buying the house. I, I get where you have that cash, uh, but the cash, you know, you, that, that'll give you the down payment, but then who's going to make the monthly payment, especially in California, you got 50 grand down, you know, starter house might be three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000. So you're still going to be carrying a substantial amount of, you know, uh, mortgage payment on that, that home. Who's going to be making those payments? Because if you're bringing in 15,000 a month in college, you know, let's say it's net a thousand dollars a month. 
you're, you're, you won't be able to afford those payments. So it's basically your co-signer is giving, putting a lot of faith in you that you will, you know, move forward with this. But the only piece of this puzzle, and don't, don't take this wrong. The only piece of the puzzle you have is the down payment that, you know, so once you buy, who's going to make those payments from there on? But if you have a very qualified co-borrower, yes, you can do it that way. Uh, Freddie Mac offers a program where you can have a non-occupant co-borrower, and FHA is probably the best route for you to go in regards to that because the, you, you can't have a, a borrower that does not live in the residency. Uh, Daniel said, do you recommend to uh, pay off a home first before getting an investment property uh, home to rent out? Uh, no, I don't think there's any need to do that as long as you're comfortable on your cash flow. Obviously, don't make everything so tight that you're uncomfortable. I think when you're going to look into getting into investing um, is where you really need to start considering having an emergency fund for both your own personal expenses and also the investment property as well. And that's just going to make sure that in the event that something happens where your income drops, you lose your income, there's um, a maintenance issue that you need to fix with the investment property or your current home, you have a nice little bit of cash savings that isn't going to force you to get into credit card debt and isn't going to land you in a position where you're not able to make a mortgage payment. So I think most people need to have a three month emergency fund, meaning that, you know, if your monthly expenses are $3,000 per month for you to be able to live your current lifestyle, you would need to have $9,000 saved in your bank account for that emergency fund. When you start looking into investment properties, it may be smart to say, I might want to bump this up to five or six months just so you have that extra cushion. And you need to also consider that uh, investment property mortgage in there. Even though that's being covered by uh, a renter, it'd be smart to have some money set aside, um, again, for maintenance issues or whatever else might come up. Also keeping in mind that it's not guaranteed you're going to have a tenant uh, in your rental property the entire time. So you may be making the mortgage payment on that um, for just a little bit. Good answer. Thank you. Um, let's see, Santa, <laughs> I'm still waiting That's to hear when, cool. you're gonna, when you're going to marry me. I've been asking for years. You know, I think this is the one we talked about the, uh, the dowry. Uh, do you have the dowry set aside? Um, if so, then we, let me know what the dowry is and then we can talk. Um, <laughs> when did dow when did were dowries a thing? Like Don't a long know. time ago, right? That's not yeah, old. yeah, a long old. time ago. Hey, got a question for you. I'll ask a question, and it was kind of my video this morning. For me, I did. I went. In, I went into Chat GPT. Pretty cool. Um, and I put in there. You know, I, I was trying to prep for this video and some future videos. I'm like, what's what's the most common asked question that people have when they're buying their first house? And guess what it was. How much uh, can I much, afford? How much can you afford? Probably. Yeah. That, that, that is the number one question. I thought, okay, that, that's kind of intriguing. Where I wanted to go with this, and I don't know if you guys are interested in it, but um, what, would, what I'd like to do is just show you guys the, the main components when you're trying to get qualified for a loan. We, we want to put, like I said in, in previously, we want to put the tools in your lap. You be able to determine this stuff for you. You know, somebody asked me, is it a great time to buy? I don't know. But let, why don't we give you some tools to do this? So I was kind of brainstorming on this. And here, Kyle, here's what I thought. Maybe we could do it in this video or, or next time or whatever. Yeah, most of the things when, when you're trying to qualify, you're trying to figure out how much you can, you can afford. Well, we, we created that max loan calculator that we've done on the last two videos. And I think it was a hit because a lot of people bought that, that program and it's fantastic. But one of the missing elements to this is your credit score. A lot of people, they, they know their credit score. They think they know what their credit score is. But when, the, when I pull it, it's much different than they expected. And it, it's a shocker to a lot of people when I do post or I get back with them saying, here's your credit score. And they're like, wait a second. My system, the other system I had says it's 740, you're saying 680. So I wanted to really explain to people what their credit, what's credit scores lenders use and, you know, so they can educate themselves on that. And then a part, a big part of that mortgage calculator that we have is it asks you, you know, how much money you make and then how much other debt do you have? And a lot of people forget about half the debt that they have. You know, oh, I didn't know if I had that credit card. I forgot about that credit card. You, you understand you got a student loan payment or a car payment, things like that but you're probably missing out on those little bills that you just don't really realize on a daily basis. So what I wanted to do, like I said, in this video or one of the uh, our future live events is to show you guys what credit scores lenders use. 
And then what you'd be able to do is go into that system, pull down your credit. So now you have your mortgage score that most lenders are going to be using. And then also a list of all the items or all the creditors that you have on your credit report. So it's basically putting the lender's credit report in your lap and then giving you a financial calculator for you to plug in the data to see, okay, what would my payment be based on X? And is that affordable to me? And so those are one of the avenues I'd really love to go down at some point. And if you guys are out there, if you could give us a thumbs up, if you'd like that or not, or, you know, maybe drill in a little bit deeper on one subject, let us know. But if you would, yeah. please post a comment. I'd love to hear from you guys. Also, um, go ahead and comment what, what uh, if you use any credit tracking software, what software do you use to track your credit score? Um, I'd be interested to know if you could put that in the, uh, the comments below or the chat. Um, Dan, here's a good question for you. Can you speak on the process of the VA Earl? Yeah. It's fantastic. If you have a VA loan um, and your rate, well, probably not right now, but if you have a VA uh, uh, loan and you've made your payments on time in the last year, what a VA Earl is, is basically an easy way to refinance that. So a lot of people, I, I don't think understand once you buy a house, if, if I watch, if I didn't know any better and I watch some, you know, TV shows or, or YouTubers, I think once I buy my house, I'm locked in. I got that rate forever and I, I'm locked in. You know, my payment's going to be that and it's going to even start going up and I don't get that facet. But, but here's what I want to explain to you. As rates come down and we're expecting them to come down pretty decently in 2024, you're going to have an opportunity where mortgage rates are going to come down enough that most likely you're going to be able to save a couple hundred bucks by refinancing. So what you can do is you can take your loan and you can apply for another loan at a lower rate to pay off that higher interest rate uh, mortgage. If you have a VA loan, it's called an EARL. It's basically a streamlined process. And we, we would love to help anybody out there with this or even FHA. FHA also has a basically an EARL program. It's called Streamline. So it does USDA. So basically what the guidelines are is we pull your credit. The only thing that really matters in there is your credit score and your mortgage rating. Nothing else matters. And the reason being is this. We don't have to re-verify your income and we don't have to reappraise the house. Okay. The reason being is you already have a VA loan or you already have an FHA or a USDA loan and you're paying on it fine because we validated that on your credit report with your payment history and your credit scores. So they're saying, well, if you can qualify at that higher rate at the higher payments, well, then if we reduce your payment, basically giving you a, a kudos for making all those payments on time, if we refinance you to a lower rate, Therefore, you're going to have a lower payment. Therefore, you should have no problem paying because it's lower than what you're paying now. So we're going to waive all the income restrictions and all the, all the uh, appraisal issues and all that. And basically, we can fly through these in probably a two-week time frame because all we really need to do is pull your credit and validate that you, you're paying those payments on time. And that goes for VA, USDA, and FHA. Nice. Uh, John said, is the... Uh, one, two program still active. Um, yes. So it's a 1% down program. You get a 2% fully forgivable grant. There's no monthly payment on it. There's no interest on it. There's no fees. There's no uh, repayment that you have to do. You can sell the home at any time and you don't have to pay back the money, um, which most down payment assistance programs require you to have to pay it back in some way, or there's interest or there's fees or there's some string attached to it. Um, so it's a really great program. We also do have an addition to that um, another program that is uh, down payment assistance for conventional, um, it's called the Purchase Plus Grant. And this depends on where you live. Um, so you want to go to winthehouseyoulove.com slash purchase plus, um, spell it out, uh, purchase, P-L-U-S. So what you do here is find what area you live in currently. Um, so there's tons of areas that qualify. Um, I forget how many exactly are in this list. But basically, they go just, through here. They just doubled it. Yeah, there's like some, I, I have a, the number down here in a second. Uh, so you put in, if you're a first-time home buyer, if you don't currently have a mortgage, uh, 12,000 areas. Um, 12,712, I guess, is uh, the more exact. Um, so go through this qualifier, and then you can see if you can qualify for this amount. So basically how it works is you have to live in uh, one of the qualifying areas, but you can purchase anywhere in the U.S. It's a little bit backwards. Most programs, it's where you're going to buy is where you qualify for it. This is you live there and then you can buy anywhere in the U.S. and get the grant. So um, both of those programs are really good. Uh, the 1% down program, 
um, is a little bit tricky because it does have an income limit um, where the purchase plus grant doesn't. So if you can't qualify for the 1% down because you make too much money, um, then we can look at the, uh, the purchase plus and see if that's an option for you. Uh, MF said, thanks guys. Um, Daniel said to refinance on your first home is one year after you purchased too soon. Um, we got our home at 6.6% rate. And if they drop to say 5% this time next year, can we refi then? You want to take yeah. that? Yeah. I, I can't just initially say yes. And here's what I mean. If, and don't take this wrong. If you're, if you have a $50,000 loan, you know, a, a reduction from six and a half to five might save you 50 bucks. Probably it might not be worth it. If you have a three, four, five, seven hundred thousand dollar home, you know, maybe it doesn't even take the rates to go, you know, if you have a million dollar loan and your rate's six and a half and you go to six, probably gonna save you enough money to make it worthwhile. So it depends on, you know, the loan size and how much you deem that it really, you know, how much, you know, would that benefit you? Like one of the questions I'm seeing on here on the side chat is, is it worth doing? Um, you know, because of all the fees that you incur and the hard credit pool and all this other stuff, it depends. You know, normally the fees are a fraction, a fraction of what they are when you're purchasing a property. Like for example, in Chicago, if you're buying a house here, uh, your title fees, if you're buying the house, probably gonna be four or 5,000 bucks. If you're refinancing, it's $900. Okay, so that's the huge difference. And again, when you're doing the VA Earl and stuff like that, you don't have an appraisal. Basically, all you're gonna have is a credit report check that should be 50 bucks and your title fees, which should be probably under a grand. So hopefully that'll guide you. If it's gonna cost you $1,000, let's say 1,500 bucks to refinance, you know, what do you want your break even point to be? You want to, you know, is a hundred bucks enough for you each month or 200 bucks or three? That's where you need to determine, you know, what, what you're looking for in the savings. And when it hits there, we'd love to help. Yeah. Uh, something that Dan and I do a terrible job of is explaining what we do. <laughs> so well, do, do you see the comment by ZL? Can you pull up ZL? Um, it's all yeah, the way pull, the I'll pull that up in okay. just a second. Okay. Um, the, uh, oh, I, I see which one you're talking about. Um, yeah, so we sit here and answer questions and then forget like, hey, we, we also can help you. Um, so we're, we're loan officers, we're licensed in all 50 states um, and we have, uh, we can offer a free um, pre-approval consultation. And so we work uh, and function like a broker. So um, think of it similarly to like, you know, if you go to a grocery store, um, milk's gonna be more expensive than if you bought it at Costco or Sam's Club. And so it's very similar to how we do mortgages is we can offer you wholesale discounts on rates. Um, so with one credit pull and one application, we shop with 70 different lenders and we work in all of the US. Um, so really it's as easy as schedule a free call um, and you can ask us questions very similarly to how we do on this uh, the live stream. Um, you'll then fill out a 15 minute application that doesn't, it's not long, it's not super complex. We just ask you questions like, where do you work? How long have you lived at your current address? How much money and savings do you currently have? And there's no right or wrong answer. There's, it's not like a, you're not going to get graded on it. It gives us information so we can help guide you into what loan is going to work best for you. You don't have to know what your debt to income ratio is. You don't have to know anything about FHA loans. We help you with all of that. You're welcome to learn about all these different types of loans on this channel. Um, but we guide you through what's going to be a good loan for you. Um, from there, we'll show you your personalized quotes. And then you're able to go ahead and take your pre-qualification letter and start shopping for homes. So you can schedule a call with us at winthehouseyoulove.com um, and we would be happy to help out. Uh, you wanted me to pull up the ones about fees? Z yeah, ZL. And this is when, I thought that's what you were re referencing because it says, how do I find an, uh, find upfront lenders that uh, give good VA Earl rates without sneaky fees? Why do they all, that's what we do. We are more, we're a mortgage lender. Let's say it that way. We actually work, we work at a federal bank that allows us to be licensed all throughout the country. And we can, you know, we work at the bank, but we also have up to 70 different lenders that we can use their, their programs and their rates for you guys. So one of the daunting things when you, when you're looking to buy your first house, isn't going through all those houses every week, you know, looking at house after house after house. At first it's fun. Then after a while, it's like, oh my goodness. But the hardest part I think is trying to find that, that the loan, because, you know, I, the other day my, my mother needed homeowner's insurance. So dumb me, I go on there and I plug in, you know, 
on, on a website that I need homeowner's insurance. I've gotten, I kid you not, probably a hundred phone calls in the last two days. I don't want those. I just want to apply at one place and then that, that person get back to me. That's what we do. So you, you put in one application, one credit pool, and we're going to search all over the country to find you the best rate, the best fee structure, basically in the market. Uh, and just to answer the second question, why do they all want you to? Do, why do they all want you to do a hard pull before they'll really help you? Um, so, really, they should be helping you even if you don't do a credit pull. But to get an actual approval from a lender, a hard pull needs to happen. And the reason why is because a soft pull. Um, think of like, okay, if you took your credit score and it existed in real life, imagine like big block numbers. Okay, a uh, a soft pull is like if we threw a blanket over top of the number. We know what the number kind of looks like. I can take a guess at what it is, but it doesn't give me all the information and all the detail that I need to know, like a hard pull will. And a hard pull only impacts your score zero to five points. And this is from Experian data. So what you'll see is if you're signed up for like credit monitoring sites, if you get a hard pull, they're gonna act like the sky is falling because they're gonna use that fear to sell you to use their company. They're gonna be like, oh my, everything's falling apart. You should use our lender instead. They use that as a tactic when you get a hard pull. And that's why so many people are afraid of a hard pull. No lender can issue you an approval that they can back up and that has a high chance of closing without a hard credit pull because that's what's required to actually run through underwriting software. So that's why lenders, reputable lenders want you to do a hard credit pull because a soft credit pull is not worth, you don't want us to say yes to you if we can't actually back it up and know that you're going to close on a home. But and Kyle, the, my, my buddy at, my, at work said that they had a lender pull their credit. It was a hard pull and they, they lost 40 points. <laughs> yeah, I, I get uh, that every day. I get it every day. Go ahead and explain that one. Well, you, yeah, I mean, you said on, it. On mortgage, the mortgage FICO that gets pulled by lenders isn't accessible on most sites to people who aren't mortgage lenders. And so there's so many different scoring algorithms for credit scores. And the ones that lenders use are proprietary and expensive available to mortgage lenders. So what you see on like soft pull sites isn't the same scoring model that's used by mortgage lenders. And so your score may drop on some of these soft pull sites, but that's not the algorithm that mortgage lenders use to uh, get you approved for a mortgage. So on the mortgage FICO, one credit inquiry changes your score zero to five points and you have 45 days where you can get your credit pulled an unlimited amount of times and it will only impact as if it was one credit inquiry. And this is from the CFPB. Like this is all information that's on cfpb.gov. They're the regulatory body that oversees the extension of credit and mortgages. Um, so there really is not a higher authority <laughs> that can give this uh, this kind of information. All right, let's let's start our speed round. We start. We're going to start a new segment here. We're going to do a speed round. We're going to start. We're we're going to have to a answer your question Ooh. within one minute. And we're going to get through, let's try to get through maybe, what do you think? Five, six, seven of them? Let's at do least? it. At least? Okay. Um, well, this isn't a question, but Mar Marcia said, I thought I wasn't ready, uh, but with these guys' help, I was able to buy my first home. It truly depends on if you're ready. Well, thanks, Marcia. Thanks, um, Marcia. We just did an interview with Marcia that uh, I'm working on putting together. Um, Duvall said, uh, what are some of the different down payment assistance programs for someone with excellent credit and a good salary? but make significantly higher than the median in the county in Florida, so do not qualify. You wanna take that? Yeah, it's tough. And let me just kind of pu pull this curtain back a little bit briefly on down payment assistance. There, There's tons of them, tons of them. I would say the majority of them aren't really a good financial strategy for you if you have enough money and the means to come up with a down payment because most of them have a catch. The catch is either there's going to be a higher rate, you're going to pay that higher rate forever, um, or there's a bunch of fees involved or things like that. Most of the time, it's not virtually free money. Now, there are programs out there that's free money. When it comes to those, 90% of those do have income caps. Um, you know, so if you make way too much money, the intent was to help people middle to low income be able to get into this market. So if you're making a ton of money, the, the thought process is you have the means to put a little bit aside each month for the down payment. Now, I, I, I understand you, you live into that paychecks as you, your income increases, but that was the reason why most of these programs were created. Ooh, Bam. 60 wow. seconds on the button. Now you beat that one, buddy. <laughs> Okay. 
That was good. That was good. I, I was I was say I need like a button over here that's like a bam or something like a. I bet I can find like a some little oh you'll find timer it. thing. Look at this. You put all this together. This is awesome. <laughs> we got to bump up the production quality a little bit. Yeah. Uh, ZL said, "Why are most homes listed above Zillow Zestimate? Uh, they said unsold for months. Why would an agent overprice? Um, wouldn't the Zestimate be good for a starting point? Then an average layman can bargain from." Um, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, the Zestimate's just something made up by Zillow. Uh, it's as simple as that. It's just an algorithm that they put together. Um, they don't want to overestimate homes because then people come to them and say, you told me my house is worth 400000 and everyone else is saying it's worth 300000 They're just a company. They made up a fake algorithm just to add some little extra point. There's no research data. There's no actual legal bearing on the Zillow Zestimate. Um, also, home sellers get to choose the price. An agent doesn't get to choose the price of a home. So an agent may say your home's worth 300000 but the home seller is like, I want three fifty, And the agent can suggest something, but the home seller ultimately gets to choose what they want. And often it's not based in reality, and it can sometimes take months, like that situation, for the seller maybe to come back into reality of what the market is offering uh, as a true price for their home. I got six seconds left. Yeah. Hey, we, we got... I want to say, I think seven contracts over the weekend, and I've spoken to at least half of the agents. Every one of them has had, one had nine offers, but what I'm getting at is there's still multiple, multiple offers on homes out there, folks. And that's, that's what, that's actually what's causing home prices to go up. And when, when we all thought it would be basically stagnant or falling. So just want to throw that out there. Um, someone said, who's a competitor to you that you also respect for loans? I think, um, Matt, the mortgage guy is really great. Uh, he, I haven't talked to him in a while, but, um, we've become internet friends, uh, through YouTube. Um, yeah, so same here. his, his channel is Matt, the mortgage guy. Um, Matt, who, Gouge, 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 I think is how you say his last name. Um, it sounds very French, but I, I don't know. Uh, but he's great. Um, I'm trying to find the next question here. Um, can I take a second mortgage to assist me in down payment closing costs? If so, which bank will do both regular mortgage plus a second mortgage, have good credit and good salary? Um, are a lot of people doing piggyback loans? Hmm. Well, what, what, happened, what used to happen in the past is you could do, they call it an 80 20. You can do an 80% first mortgage, and then you're going to get a home equity loan for the, the balance, the 20%. That equals 100%. I don't know of anybody out there that does those anymore. That was more subprime stuff that basically was, you know, you can buy a house with a 580 credit score, no money down, and 100% financing. Even a home equity loan. If you own the house outright and you're just trying to get a home equity loan, most of those are capped at 90% because they don't want to over leverage on these houses because if there is a turn in the markets, you know, all these banks, basically all those home equity loans are worthless because you can't really collect on that debt as a lender because you'd have to foreclose on the house to get your money back. And there's probably not enough money to pay off the first mortgage. So there would be nothing left for a second lien holder. So there's a lot of schematic behind the scenes, but I, I don't, I do not think that program even exists anymore. Yeah. Um, Gary Johnson said, uh, Hey guys, I've followed you both for a while and your information has been incredible. Well, thanks. Hey, thank Is this you, the Gary. same Gary Johnson that ran for president? Like, eight years ago or so, 10 years ago, however long that was. Hope Do you remember so. that guy? Rerun. No, there's so many people that run for president Do you remember anymore. who that guy was? And I feel like his, wasn't his like big point, like he wanted to legalize marijuana and that was like groundbreaking at that time. Is yeah. that the game? Am I thinking about that? I don't know. Johnson? I don't know. Yeah. Um, Mayor said, uh, isn't, oh, I forgot. I got to put my timer here. Oh, here we go. Don't get too nervous, buddy. Come on, click it up while you're wasting the time. It's valuable time here. I know. I'm, I'm thinking before we can do this. Uh, isn't pre-approved different um, from pre-qualified? So these don't have like le fully legal definitions. A lot of lenders use them interchangeably. You'll find pre-qualified is the most common one because it tends to be the most compliant use of the language. And I know it kind of gets into the weeds a little bit. Basically, what most people understand is that um, being pre-approved is when an underwriter takes a look at your file. Um, most loans are pre-qualified. Now, the level of the how much they look into that depends on the lender. We think it's good that we have a full look at your income, full look at your assets, an application, 
and a hard credit pull to give you an accurate pre-qualification. Some lenders just see if you're breathing and they're like, here's a pre-qual. Um, and really that's up to you. Do your deal, due diligence to make sure they're actually checking to see that you qualify for a loan and they're not just issuing a, I clicked a button and two minutes later, I got a pre-qualification. You want something to actually, you can trust it's going to close when you find the house that you want to buy. Ooh, man, these, they're- That was good, buddy. That was real it's good. tough. But you know, I think this is good practice in being concise. Yep. Um, but uh, man, it's- You'll it's, probably it's give fun. me a hard one like you usually do. <laughs> You know, I do that. I specifically choose the hard ones just for you. Um, Wade said, upgrading from a starter house, are there any extra considerations if I want to buy and move before listing? Um, okay, so you already own a home. Upgrading from a starter house, you're going to buy another home. Um, are there any extra considerations if I want to buy and move before listing? Does only debt to income ratio matter? No, I think I can answer this fairly quick. Yeah. The, the, the biggest components when you're trying to get pre-qualified uh, are is your income, your credit scores, and your debt, and that in reference to your DTI. So I, I had, I think it was today, it was today or yesterday, I, had, I pulled credit on somebody and I got back with them and I was going over their debts with them and they're like, I have no idea what those two or three accounts are. That's what we're trying to help you guys with. So if, you know, it, it's never too early really to get started on the process. But uh, I would highly suggest you get your FICO credit score. Uh, that'll give you your accurate credit score that lenders are gonna use. It'll also give you a list of all the creditors on your credit so you can understand, you can make through, go through there and validate them that they are accurate and so forth. Your income, there's nothing you can really do to your income You know, within a month or two of buying a house. And then also try to save as much money as you can, put that aside if there's not enough equity in your house at the time you sell for the down payment. So that's what I would suggest. Nice. Um, Gary has another question, but I'm going to, I'm going to ask the same question just in a different way. Um, when we're looking at interest rate locks, um, and I'll just kind of explain, explain briefly what that is. But Dan, my question to you is going to be, when should people lock their interest rate? And for a lot of people, they don't really realize that their interest rate is going to change with the market until they lock the loan. Usually you need to be under contract to lock your loan. There are programs that allow you to lock and shop, meaning you find that market interest rate, you lock it in and you can shop for a home, but those can be a little bit more expensive. Um, you'll pay some upfront fees for that. But uh, basically you find a home and the interest rate's gonna float up and down as it does in the market, but then you can lock it at a certain point where it stays there until closing. And then if you have a fixed loan, it's gonna be fixed for the duration. So yeah. for people who are seeing interest rates coming down, and I don't know if I still have that chart up here, but interest rates that were actually kind of flattening um, over the past few days, uh, when do you suggest people look at locking in an interest rate? Here, here's, uh, this is going to be kind of a multi-answer question to you. Okay. So what we usually do is when you, when you come to us, we, we'll lock in. OK, we have the option like Kyle, when he brought up the, you know, what do we do for a living? Kyle, can you bring up that chart again? What we do and the lenders and so forth. OK, so if you see up there, you're going to see that is one credit pool, one application and 70 lenders. OK, so what this gives us is gives us a, 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 a head, you know, basically a little bit better options for you guys, because we can when we take your application and we get you started and we get you, you, fi you find that house, we're going to lock in your rate. So think of locking in the rate is like you bought a stock. Okay, this is my analogy I use. Let's say you like Google stock and you're watching it and you're watching it. It's going up and down. Now it's starting to rally up and up and up. That means you're floating. You didn't do anything. You're watching it. But now you jumped in and you bought it. So now you own Google stock. Well, that's the same thing how it happens with your rate lock. Once you lock it, it's yours. It's yours. You can't, the next day, if rates go down, you can't go back and say, ah, sorry, you know, can I turn this back in and get the lower rate? Doesn't work that way. But with us, because of all the lenders we have, we can lock you in here. And let's say, for example, rates plummet, like we've seen in the last month, month and a half. We can move you to another lender because we have 69 others to choose from. OK, but we usually lock you in within three weeks of closing. When, when you hit that three week time frame, we usually lock you. We don't want any uncertainties because some people they're on the they're on the smidgen of just qualifying. So if that rate goes up a quarter percent, they don't qualify anymore. 
Um, so that's we'd lock you in. However, if we have enough time, you know, if you're th three weeks or more from your closing, we have enough time to move your loan if rates have dropped during that time frame. But you, we usually, when you, when the application's in, we get you pre-qualified. When you put the house under contract, we'd lock you immediately just to make sure nothing's going to change. And then if they dramatically drop and you're not closing for at least three weeks, we can move that loan around a little bit. I hope that answered your question for mm -hmm. you. It depends on when you're closing. Some people are closing in 30 days. We lock in and we just, we have to go with it or we lock in 45 days, 60 days. If you're 60 days from closing, we can come all the way up to 30 days. And if rates dropped, I can move you to a different lender and lock you to a 30 day rate, get you a lower rate, lower fees and everything else. But um, that's how it works. Uh, let's see, are lenders obligated to provide the index and spread when they quote your rate? Um, so only on an adjustable rate mortgage, do you see the index and the spread because that's how, what the interest rate is based off of but a fixed rate loan isn't based off of an index and a spread in that way. Um, so fixed rate loan, or short answer is fixed rate loan, no, adjustable rate mortgage, yes, it's required to be on the uh, the loan estimate. Uh, Zachary said, um, also thanks for asking a question, Zach. I think you've asked a couple in here. Um, what happens if I had a gap in employment? Oh, I forgot the timer here. What happens if I had a gap in employment for a couple months within the past two years um, from when I want to buy? Me? Yeah. You want to take that? Oh, yeah. It depends. It depends on how big the gap is, when the gap was. A lot of times, if it's just a short duration of time, it's no big deal. What they're looking for is months and months and months or years, uh, years gaps. So a lot of times what we do is I'll kind of pull the curtain behind the screen just a little bit. I talk, everybody I talked to on the phone, I explain the process to them because I want you guys to understand it. What we do is, you know, if you're applying for a loan or a mortgage, you put in your application. You know, with ours, it's the website. Uh, we'll, we'll then behind the scenes, we'll pull your credit and then we're going to take that data and we're going to upload it into Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Doesn't matter if you know who they are. It's the two entities out there that probably have approved 90% of all the mortgages in the country. Okay. That's what we use. Um, so as long as that, when we ran it through the system, as long as we're getting an approve eligible with the, the timeframes that we have, you shouldn't have an issue. But we'll most likely, you know, we've, we've done this long enough. When we're analyzing everything, we'll be like, uh, there might be an issue here. It might have been long enough that what we usually do in my case, I'll call an underwriter and just go through the scenario and kind of get them to okay that uh, prematurely to just say, yeah, that, that one's fine. But most of the time when we run your loan through Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, and it, it, if it approves your loan, then we're usually okay in that scenario. Uh, okay. Let's Mari said is selling, uh, our house after two years, a bad idea. We bought our house last April for 490,000 in Washington, paying a rate of 5.6%. We bought down the rates for 4,000 home price increases, uh, by them. Um, I guess, so follow up question, what is making you think that it's a bad idea, uh, to sell your house? Um, and are you wanting, why are you wanting to move? homes. Um, if you can give me a little, give us a little insight on that, we might be able to, to add a little bit there. Is there anything else that you're seeing in there that might be helpful? No. Is selling our house after two years a bad idea? I mean, it depends on why, if you're selling the cash out or yeah, I, I would need to know why you're selling. Not that I need to know, but to answer the question, you know, what are you doing? Where, where are you going to live? Are you buying another house? There, that's an open gap there. Sorry about that. Uh, KP11 said, hello, found a lender to approve a construction to permanent loan. Um, rate will still be high. Am I able to refinance sooner than later? Um, also based off income, trying to figure out how much. Okay, let me answer the first question. Um, can you refinance sooner than later? Yeah, you can refinance anytime. Um, there's no restrictions. Just double check on your loan estimate. There's no prepayment penalties. I haven't seen a loan with a prepayment penalty in ever. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. so just double check. Um, but you shouldn't have any issues refinancing. Just keep in mind, and this is more of a, you get to choose what to do. If you refinance within six months of closing on a home, uh, your lender is going to get hit with a penalty. And so you, you can choose, if it was me, I would choose to wait because that person helped me spend a lot of time working on a loan for me. I don't want them to get hit with a penalty. I would choose to wait at least six months, but, um, it's really up to you. There's no obligation there. Uh, your second question was based off of income, trying to figure out how much I qualify self-employed five years in the business. Um, do me a favor. Uh, I'll put my email here in the chat. 
Um, it's Kyle at winthehouseyoulove.com. Uh, email, uh, and I'll loop in Dan into this, email us your business and personal tax returns for the past two years. And what we'll do is that we'll put that into the calculators that uh, lenders use um, or underwriters use to see what income we can use on that because uh, we could spend an hour talking about what income can be used and all the different uh, things that we can add back and all the different circumstances. It's just easiest if we can take it, put it into the calculator and tell you the answer um, a lot quicker. So uh, we can do that for you. Uh, I live in London. I'm considering buying in the U S are there mortgage products that cater to this? And if so, um, what do they entail? This is kind of, oh, I mean, I'm getting a lot of these right now and where I'm getting, we do have, you know, foreign nationals and, and other programs like that, uh, for people who don't live in the, in the U S the difficulty is, is credit. Um, cause we have to pull your credit. Um, it, it's a U.S. loan, so you'd have to file and have income in the U.S. Uh, it, it's a really hard loan to do. Uh, is it? Is there an option or availability to get it done? Yeah, but they're they're really hard uh, because we have to make sure your income. We have to translate it many times into the U.S. You have to have a U.S. Social Security number. Uh, you have to have valid credit scores and credit within the U.S. or you know a tangible. A, a comparable uh, credit system from where you live. And it's just, I've never been able to get one through, put it that way. <laughs> not, not making that sound completely doom and gloomy, but um, it's not something we really go after. So I don't have a lot of exposure with it, but I just, Kyle, do you, do you know the options no, for them in that? Okay. My, so I'm, I'm yeah, I'd have to that. defer on that. If you want to email me, I'd love to get, I'll research some products and get back with you with what, you know, what might fit for you. I have no problem doing that. Um, let's see. SK said, what is the current rate for a VA loan? Um, so if you go to when the house you love.com, we have, uh, what the national average rates are here. Um, so VA would be looking at just below a 6.3% on a 30 year um, for a VA. Uh, Chris said, are you able to compete with a new builder's incentive of $10,000 towards closing if I use uh, their lender, $400,000? Uh, thanks. So basically the way that the builder incentives work is that you have to use that lender to get the incentive from the builder. So that one specific lender. If you work with any other lender, you can't get the incentive from the builder. How this is legal, still don't know. Um, but it is somehow. And uh, so you're welcome to... Uh, send us your quote and we can see if we can beat it. Sometimes uh, builders can charge so much that even if you get the incentive of 10,000, we can sometimes still offer lower fees. It really just depends. It's kind of a 50, 50 shot. Um, so you can go to win the slash compare, upload your quote, and then we'll scan it through uh, the investors that we work with and see if we can offer you something lower. And if not, we'll let you know and we'll say, Hey, you go with the $10,000 credit with that lender. Um, and, uh, we just want you to get whatever's going to be the best deal for you. Yeah. Uh, instant authority marketing. Do you ever help people purchase a home inside of an LLC? Um, I'm yeah, so I, I can first say I can answer on the residential side. If you want to jump into the investor side, Dan, uh, mm -hmm. on the residential side, anybody can purchase a home They you have to close it in your name, but then you can refinance it into, I'm sorry, not refinance you can uh, transfer the title of the home into an LLC. Um, so on a conventional loan, that won't be an issue. There's a provision in there that says you can um, do a quick claim into an LLC. That's what my home, my home is not in my name. I closed it in my name and then did a quick claim deed, transferred the title to uh, an LLC that I set up for the home. Um, we also, if you wanna close in an LLC, that would be a technically a commercial loan. So those would be investment products. Um, Dan, if you want to cover like yeah. DSCR. There are, things. Yeah, there are programs and they, they're called, normal mortgages are called Q, qualified mortgages, QM. Not Then there's what kind of used to be like the subprime or the, yeah, that's a bad name to say. There are other programs out there and they're, they're called non-QM. Now the non-QMs are, are loans like uh, DSCR. Main, meaning it's a, you're, as long as the investment property, it's called debt service coverage ratio. So if you're buying an investment property, as long as the debt services itself, meaning as long as the rents are greater than, uh, equal to or greater than 
what your payment would be on the mortgage, you qualify and you can close those in an LLC. There's bank statement programs, there's profit and loss bank uh, programs, things like that. Those programs you can close in an LLC, usually comes with a higher down payment and higher rates though. But yes, you can do those. Man, with 30 seconds remaining. I was Ooh. flying. Uh, let's see, um, Pavin said, I'm working on, I'm working with Alan on an FHA loan. Dan, Kyle, you guys are amazing. Well, thanks. Uh, Alan is on our team. Um, and if you schedule a call here with us, we have a free consultation call, call when the house you love.com. Um, then you can set up a time that works for you. I can pull up the little graphic here. Uh, and you probably are going to uh, talk with either Alan or David or Dan, uh, who's right here. Um, so if you want to do the same thing, again, we do a, a free consultation up front. You can ask us questions. We'll walk you through the process. You do a 15 minute application. We're just asking you some general questions about your financial situation. Then we're going to show you what loans you qualify for, give you a personalized quote, and then you can start shopping for homes, which tees me up for the next uh, question with, that Mayor said, or I guess it's more of a statement. Uh, they said, when I was looking for a home, the seller wanted a pre-approval letter before showing. Um, yeah, and you, most sellers uh, aren't going to accept an offer or even just let you see the home without knowing that you have the financial means to do so. And if you were a seller, put yourself in that situation, you're not just going to let anybody put in an offer on your home and use up your time and potentially put some of your money at risk if you don't know that they can actually, they have the money to be able to buy the home. And that's why you need a letter that states your financial ability to be able to purchase a home. Um, so whether it's a pre-qualification letter, pre-approval letter, it really doesn't matter what it's called. It just needs to be able to say what was checked about the buyer's financial situation. Like, was their credit checked? Was their income checked? Did we check that they have enough money for down payment and closing costs? Were they run through the uh, underwriting software to be able to be eligible for a home loan? And that's what sellers and listing agents are looking for when they're entertaining offers. That was seven minutes and 48 seconds. <laughs> no, I, that was a multi-combo question <laughs> that that deserved a separate timer. Um, Joey, Merry third day of Christmas. Uh, MBS yeah. Market is seeing some nice gains today. We all love lower mortgage rates. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Thanks, Joey. Um, Henry H. said just, hi, guys, me wife. Me wife. I'm, hi, Henry and me wife. <laughs> Not sure what to... Uh, what to do with with that one? Um, hey, we're we're hitting that that time here. Oh, there's a follow up. Hey guys, my wife and I. Okay, I think it got cut off. <laughs> this is making more sense, Henry. Uh, my wife and I have a 795 score, and we're making 140 thousand dollars a year. Uh, we need to put five percent down for a conventional loan. Oh, do we need to put five percent down for a conventional loan, or we can do three percent? You want to take that? Yep, 3%. Go with 3%. And a lot of the captions read, you have to be a first time home buyer. Some programs you truly have to be and you have to be, you know, for three or five years or so forth. A lot of the programs say you, you have to be a first time home buyer. You just can't own a house at the time you close on the house that you're looking to buy right now. So there's, it, it's it's used kind of like, as freely as pre-approval versus pre-qualification. Okay. So but um, you, in most cases, you can get away with 3% down or depending on you know, some other pieces of the puzzle, you might even look at going with an FHA loan, which only requires 3.5% down. So those are the two options that you got. Um, yes, David is still on our team. Um, Max said, in your opinion, how low do interest rates need to go to unlock meaningful supply? Um, we covered that just a bit earlier. Let me see if I can pull up that... Uh... Oh, that chart again. Here it was. Let me just pull this out. Um, so this is showing uh, all the data up to uh, this year, basically showing what percentage of homeowners have what interest rate. So below a 3%, um, about 23-ish oh, percent have below a 3% interest rate. Um, below a 4%, you have 60% of people have below a 4% and then 80% of people have below a 5% interest rate. So when we're talking about like unlocking inventory in a sense that lower interest rates would encourage people or 
alleviate the burden of people selling their home and getting a higher mortgage rate, um, it's probably going to have to be pretty low. Uh, like even if rates went down to, let's say 4%, um, you still have 60% of homeowners who have under a 4% interest rate. Now, of course, people buy homes, not just because of the interest rate. There's hundreds of reasons that people buy a house outside of just what the interest rate is. Dan, did you buy your house because of the interest rate? No, no. <laughs> I've been I in my house my for house. 22 years. <laughs> yeah. I didn't buy my house because of the interest rate. Nobody that we work with is like, I'm buying a house because of the interest rate. Even yeah. when rates were low 3%, no one was like, I'm buying a house because of the interest rate. Um, yeah. however it does make people feel like they're stuck in their home because they don't want to give up, uh, either their current payment or their payment on a new home would be much higher. Uh, for yeah. a similarly priced home. Um, did you notice how I didn't use a timer there, Dan? Yeah, I know. That was 17 <laughs> minutes and 41 seconds. Oh. Oh, All right, one more and then we'll call it a day because I got a lot of applications to work on. Uh, do you have to pay PMI with only 3% or 5% down? Yes, you have to pay PMI on a conventional loan if you do less than 20% down. Um, how does everyone feel about uh, this time? that we do these live streams at. Um, normally we'll do them at like, uh, what, 7.30 Eastern? And now yeah. we're doing it at three Eastern, um, which is really nice for Dan and I, because I, I don't like doing it at 7.30 at night. Nor do um, I. And you know, we've had more people on this stream. Right now there's about 150 people combined on the multi-stream. And uh, this is more than what we normally have. So let me know if everyone's everyone likes this time because we'll do it at the same time then. Um, thank you all for stopping by. Uh, there's so many ways that we can help you out. Uh, you can go to winthehouseyoulove.com to either ask us a question and we'll reply with a personalized video just like we do in these live streams. Um, or you can schedule a free consultation call with us. Um, you can see we do one credit pool, one application, and we shop your loan with 70 different lenders to find you the best rate. Um, it's really just a simple process. Schedule a call, fill out an application. We'll show you your quotes and the loans that you qualify for. And then you'll be able to um, shop for homes uh, with a real estate agent. So thank you all for being here, Dan. Thank you as well. Happy, happy New Year's, folks. And uh, we'll talk to you all next week. Take care.